Modern democracy resides in the nation state, but in a globalizing world where goods, money, people, and ideas transcend traditional borders, does democracy falter or flourish? Let's find out. Joining us now in London, UK, Saskia Sassen. She is professor of sociology and co-chair of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. And with us in studio, Fahim Kadir. He is associate professor of social science and development studies at York University. William Coleman, CG Chair in Globalization and Public Policy at the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and Janet Conway, Canada Research Chair in Social Justice at Brock University. And Saskia Sassen, I want to thank you for joining us overseas and to our friends here in the studio. We're grateful you could participate as well. I want to kick off our conversation just by reading the last paragraph of something called the Manifesto for a Global Democracy, which Saskia Sassen signed, along with some other fairly notable signatories, including Noam Chomsky. Here's how it goes. We ask every human being to participate in the constitution of a global democracy. Autonomy and self-determination are not only valid at the local and national level, that's why we champion the principle of the right to participate in the making of fundamental global decisions that directly affect our lives. We want to be citizens of the world and not its mere inhabitants. Therefore, we demand not just a local and national democracy, but also a global democracy. Okay, that's what we want to get into tonight. And Saskia, we'll start with you. What kinds of decisions, for example, are fundamental global decisions in your view? Well, I think a whole range of decisions, frankly. What has happened is a kind of capture at the top of not just expressing and commanding, but of making the logic. So in the name of rescuing the banks, all kinds of abuses have happened, including that citizens' money at the rate of 15 billion a month was paid for the past two years. So there is a kind of notion that we, the citizens, are sort of, we, are, we have forgotten how to make how to make justice, how to make our citizenship, how to make rights. So I think that the notion is not, it's not the voting vector, having a voice via the vote. It is really the active making of democracy. And, and, and in a way, we really have become consumers of everything, including consumers of our citizenship. Hmm. So the, the call is a call to make. Now, at what level, at what scale? that will vary according to whatever the issue at hand. And, and so now th there are all kinds of, we, I'm sure we'll g get into it, you know, how do we communicate, how do we decide, what are majorities, what are minorities, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the call, the call is for us to become makers of our citizenship, makers of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just curious, one of the words you used in that answer was, we have forgotten how to do democracy. What, why, how is it that we have forgotten to do it? Because I think we have re been rendered um, sort of a bit useless to the making of. We just consume. Voting is such a minimalist event. We need to know so little to vote. And we are bombarded with, with ideas. We don't have decision power. Why is it that the financial system can make enormous decisions? as to what ought to be done. And the executive branch of government, the branch of government, which in liberal democracy, we the citizens have least standing. Our standing really is with the legislative or with parliament. So it is quite interesting to see that between the executive branch of government and dominant corporate sectors with finance, really, I always think of it as the steam engine of our epoch. It's everywhere, directly or indirectly. So, that they, those two critical powerful actors, which is of course many, many individuals, many, many committees, many, many organizations eh, compose that, constitute that, they are making the decisions. The Federal Reserve has an inordinate power nowadays. This is the central bank, any central bank in any major country, I should have put it in those terms, an inordinate power to generate the policies that are good, in quotation marks, for the people. When did that, when the, where did we go wrong? You know, it, it, I mean, there was a time when there were elements in society like strong trade unions, a lot of small credit unions, the banking function was widely distributed 
across, you know, small entities that were constituted by the members, that is all gone. So now we really are consumers, and we are minimalist as consumers. That, that is a bit the thought. Let me do one more with you before we get everybody else in here, because you were, after all, a signatory to yeah. this document we're talking about. Yeah. And just so we're clear, yeah. democracy for you obviously means more than simply voting once every four years or however long it is. Yeah. So add to the list. Yes. To be a truly engaged citizen at the dawn of the 21st century in a democracy means what? Well, it means really a very broad range of issues. It means that we are really well informed as to what are major decisions that are made by the specialists, by the people with the power to make those decisions, about how food is going to be labeled, about what we're going to hear about toxicity in our homes and toxicity in, in the cities where we live or in the workplaces where we are. It means enabling uh, the, the proliferation of choices and notions, say now it is, just to mention a familiar element, urban farming, the notion of making our food, you know, or sort of regional economies. The, the sort of, and it means really there is a, there is a learning curve that, that is a very sharp learning curve. There is a lot to learn. And, um, and not so much delegating. Now, it also means really thinking through what is democracy. Because I don't know anymore, frankly, what democracy is. When I see the Occupy movements, which have recurred around the world, each one with a genealogy of meanings its own, each with deep histories of protest and contestation that are different, and yet, at ground level, across the world, over these last four or five years, all these movements share something. And what they share is made up of two parts. Number one, it's not about just entering existing party politics. Number two, it is about, I think at this stage, developing capabilities to become makers again. Now, right now, those capabilities are more social than political, I think. Huh? How to keep, I mean, when you occupy, you know, it's hard work. How to keep the peace, how to keep everybody fed, how to not get into, you know, an unpleasant situations or high-risk situations. So I think when, when people say the Occupy movements went nowhere, no, that's incorrect. The Occupy movements became one instrumentality for people to learn again how to make, in this case, I repeat, how to make social capabilities. So, you know, this is a trajectory. This manifesto is just that. It's a manifesto. It's a call to action. It's a call to awareness. And of course, it's going to be a minority. Any big movement that you see, uh, movements by the power less. The, the women's rights, black people's rights, you know, indigenous people's rights, it starts minimally. And it's, uh, it, these are histories made by the powerless, but they make a history. They have made these histories, even though they didn't get empowered. You know, it took a very, very long time. So I think that this notion of a call for rethinking what it means to be a citizen and what it means to live in our world, what it means to transcend the narrowness, the increasing narrowness of interstate politics, you know, the formal interstate politics. I think these are trajectories, you know, and I, I think of it as a call. Mind you, some other signatories probably have uh, far more developed notions as to how, what we ought to be doing. I, for me, it is let, you know, let a lot of voices bloom. I can learn from the Semterra in Brazil. I can learn, you know, from all kinds of, of situations. People with, in very modest conditions may not have had a formal education, but they have a project. And, and we can learn from that. Now, we are the articulators, the narrators, you know, the, I can imagine this, this movement having a diversity of people. And somebody like me is probably best at narrating, which, <laughs> you know, I say with a bit of shame, but. Well, you've narrated us to a good start here, if I may say, and, and set the table nicely for the discussion to come. So Janet Conway, she mentioned Occupy, actually, the last time you were here, we were talking mm -hmm. about Occupy. Mm -hmm. Some people might listen to that list of things that Saskia just put on the table for consideration as what's part of a, an effective democracy at the dawn of the 21st century and ask, don't our local, provincial, national governments already handle all of these things? This notion of we need some kind of global approach to democracy? Why? What's the answer? Well, I guess I would, 
I guess I would disagree with that premise. That um, first of all, I, I would agree with Saskia that uh, democracy as an aspiration is a very much alive in the world. Uh, it's alive in all the movements that I'm aware of. Uh, however, it's, uh, those movements would not pose the problem as one of their own capabilities. They would pose the problem of, as one of power. That, uh, that democracy as we understand it and how it's been institutionalized in the world, how it's being exercised, has been evacuated of any real content. And um, that the, the movements, for example, of the World Social Forum, which uh, you know, I've been uh, tracking for the last decade, um, they practically uh, universally call for greater democracy. But they're also very, very um, rigorous critics of uh, the prevailing notion of democracy, which is liberal and representative, and which is exported around the world more uh, often than ever at the end of a gun. And it's evacuated of any real choice because it's happening in the context of uh, the Washington Consensus, which is, uh, you know, the... the, yeah, the I, I agree hold, completely. Can I, can I finish my point? Let me finish Sassy, my yeah, point, Stand please. by. Let's, let's that, go uh, in, in the World Social Forum, for example, I would say um, there are at least three uh, trajectories around democracy. One is, one, is uh, a group that would call for uh, global institutionalization of democracy in the way that this manifesto talks about it. In the World Social Forum, they're the minority. And I would say they're also identified with elite NGOs. Uh, the, by far the largest swath of movements in the World Social Forum advocate um, a strengthening of democracy at the national scale. That's necessary but insufficient, but that the nation state remains absolutely critical to the aspirations of these movements. Critical and, or supreme? No, critical, important, not only. Uh, a third major trajectory would be the autonomous movements, which I think were very prevalent in the Occupy movement worldwide. And these are, you know, uh, young people, many of them anarchists, very um, uh, strong critics of the nation state, which they understand as an authoritarian state, including our own. And these uh, critics are trying to rebuild democracy in a different way outside the state often and at the local scale. So, you know, these are three major, major trajectories that are operating in the global justice movements. And they don't all agree, even though they all aspire to, to some kind of enriched participatory uh, democracy. Sounds and, like they're all competing with each other, though. Uh, well, they're in conversation. Let's put it that okay. way. They're in conversation with each other. And... Um, I would say that the globalist strategies are the most problematic, and they're problematic for the same reason this manifesto is problematic. Okay, Saskia, you have to wait a second. I, I no, 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 hang on. Okay. We gotta let everybody else in here first, and then no. we're gonna get you on. Uh, Fahim, I would like your uh, response I, to what I, you've heard. I, I think I, I need to make a kind of departure from the, the discussion of global democracy, just to look at the traditional understanding of democracy that we have. I think uh, I personally find the whole discussion of democracy that has been happening for the last number of years, particularly the last two decades, extremely limiting. And it's largely because everything uh, focuses, exclusively focuses on the national state. We hope that, that by fostering a culture of democracy, by creating a transparent, accountable structure of governance, we may be able to improve the human conditions. That all does not necessarily happen, number one. The second aspect of it, even if you know that the country that we are concerned with is making an effort to institutionalize democracy that may not be enough for them to address the pressing concerns of their own citizens. And it's largely because of the, uh, the institutions that are operating outside of their purview mm -hmm. are tremendously affecting the decision-making processes at the national level. So if the country wants to do something reflecting on the needs and the priorities of their own citizens, they can't do it. Think of the 1990s movements, the, the, the so-called IMF riots. People are concerned, deeply concerned, that the countries made a transition in Eastern Europe and uh, Latin America and South Africa, South Asia. They made, made a transition to constitutional democracy, but people are not happy. The power the government used to have does not necessarily exist anymore. They have to share it with international institutions, supranational institutions, uh, but particularly those that we call the consensus forming institutions. So I think we have to move beyond the, the traditional discussions of democracy to see whether democracy can be understood at the global level. If and you are can, we doing that? 
We, I don't think so. We are not doing it yet. I think we were a bit optimistic right after the 2008 economic meltdown. That hasn't happened. So you have to start with the creation of what I call a new concept of citizenship. I think I go back to what uh, Professor has uh, in, just mentioned, that I think it, it's important for us to create new values, new normative principles that would bring people together to construct a new identity for us. That should be the beginning for us to construct a new agenda. And Will? that is global democracy. Let's get Will's reaction to what yes, he's heard I, so far. I think all of the statements here have been very helpful, but I think one other perhaps idea we have to put on the table is that uh, since the early 1970s, there has been a new way of thinking called neoliberalism that has been very prominent. And what neoliberalism has, one of the aspects that it has contained is that the state itself should shrink. That is, the responsibilities for take carrying out, maybe health care or education or other kinds of things, should be shared with the private sector, if not fully carried out by the private sector. So the, the issue of democracy then is impacted by these kinds of changes because the state itself is, is a kind of a shell of what it once was before under the conditions of neoliberalism. And then when we map that kind of change onto the uh, growing need for for countries to work with one another on a more global scale, what's happening is that that kind of uh, work by governments is completely inaccessible because the government itself is inaccessible. I mean, we can look here in Canada and see the vast changes to government that have taken place over the past 20 years, particularly the past seven or eight years, uh, that have led to uh, an end in, in many ways uh, about even liberal democracy in some respects in, in many countries. Such as? Well, liberal democracy uh, involves uh, uh, an electoral system, for example. Now, we have, we have, uh, had, have a government here in Canada that has followed governments in the United States that has sought to limit the right of poorer people in the population to actually vote. They're coming up with policies that will make it more difficult for poorer people to vote and therefore to reserve the vote for people who are wealthier in a society. Just so we're clear here, you're referring to the new so-called Fair Election Act in Canada where you can no longer vouch for somebody, and obviously more poorer people and better off people may not have identification and therefore they may be disenfranchised. Is that the gist of it? Price. Okay. Precisely. That, that is a terrible development, but it is one that has occurred also in the United States of America and other countries. So what we've seen is a shrinking of democracy in terms of the role of what governments do, but we've also seen a shrinking of democracy in terms of who can participate. If you look at African Americans in the United States, you can see that virtually none of them participate. The people who vote in an election is under 50 percent, and in congressional elections is under 30 percent. So the democracy is very unhealthy at the nation state level. So when we talk about uh, global democracy, we also have to take into account that the, the state today is not an independent item. It is part of a global governance system. And so what happens at the, the, the nation state level becomes then repeated at the global level. Can I, can I just check on one thing you just said? Virtually nobody who's African American in the United States votes anymore? I'm saying that the voting participation by African Americans is very, very low. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it is also, again, law. That is, that in the, at the state level, there have been legislation brought in that make it very difficult for, for example, African Americans to have a, an identity, to present okay. a valid identity card so they can vote. OK, Saskia, you've had a chance to hear what everybody here has had to say. Do you want to react to anything you've heard? Well, I think first we need to put two types of clarifications on the table. I did not write this manifesto. Anybody who knows my work knows that I don't float upwards to that global level. I crawl inside the national, so to speak, to detect the global, how it gets constituted inside the national. Uh, so I, 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 I signed it, and I believe, and I sign all kinds of things, because I want to mobilize people. My main idea is making, that we become makers, makers of economies. That doesn't mean of everything. Makers of democracy, makers of our citizenship. That is what I emphasized. This is not some sort of, uh, for me, you know, very idealistic thing. There is a bit of, there's clearly a lot of idealism in it. But mm -hmm. I think that we need to just mobilize people around possibilities. I mentioned urban farming. 
you know, that has really mobilized people on small scales. That is not going to solve all the problems. The second set of issues is this question of the state. So I think of the working uh, democratic state, and it can be a poor state, as a complex capability, which has far more logics to it, has to negotiate the logic of finance, of banking, of the workers, of the environment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, than the richest firm. I detest those comparisons where you list, you know, what are the richest countries, and then after about country number 30, it's all firms. No, firms have one logic. They are elementary capabilities on some level compared with the normative complexity that a working liberal state has. Now, the problem is that really in the last 30 years, I think the liberal state is a decaying algorithm. That is one language to put it. It's simply mm. not. It worked under very particular conditions for a while in the West. It captured a mixture of demands it implemented, you know, public sector goods, public schools, public transport, et cetera, et cetera. And now it is absolutely focused on something that has very little to do with people's needs. So my, my notion is that, you know, it's a bit like let a thousand flowers, uh, uh, what is it, bloom. grow or, yeah. or, you know, thrive. Mm. Right, bloom. But, you know... It, because I think we don't know exactly. I would not presume, and I don't believe anybody has, what's the formula. And what was said before by Jane, I guess, about these three different strands within the World uh, Social Forum, I think that's great. We need debates. We need, we cannot all agree with each other. So I think that, that there is a lot of work to be done. I mentioned that too. There is an enormous learning curve. We need to learn about all kinds of things, we, wh whether it is how prisons work, how the voting laws work. There is a lot of work to be done. And as I keep saying, for me, as a signatory of this particular manifesto, mind you, I have signed many manifestos. This is just one of them. <laughs> uh, it's a call. It's an invitation. You know, it's mobilizing. Okay, we've got and, some more feedback here like in about... Toronto to what you've said. Fahim, you want yeah, to yeah. follow up? I, yes, I yes. Think so. I, I personally use the term called the realistic utopia. It, it, the discussion <laughs> of democracy becomes rather constraining when we just focus on elections. And we know there are places where people went to the voting stations, cast yeah. their vote. Nothing really changed. They are still trapped in the poverty cycle. They cannot bring out themselves of their miseries, et cetera. So I think the, what I, the discussion needs to uh, do or should do is to address some of the pressing concerns people are facing on a daily basis. And I'm looking at some of the recent examples, uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, Ukraine, or Venezuela. We have elected governments. And these governments are not able to live up to the expect expectations of the citizens. They are not able to respond to the needs of the people. And they, in fact, use democratic institutions in many cases to promote personal interest, uh, financial interest of very specific groups of society. I think we, if we are to go beyond that, you have to start asking serious questions about the notion of democracy. What does it do anywhere? What democracy is all about? If it is about just uh, creating a constitutional structure of governance, then I think we'll stop there. We cannot really move further understanding the importance of environmental sustainability, social justice, and equality. I think that's the reason why I'm optimistic about the prospect for creating a new concept of citizenship that transcends divides, and that also at the same time raises important questions about the state their practices and how those practices affect the lives and livelihoods of ordinary citizens. Let me move this along by reading something. I agree something. with that. Okay, let me... Uh, <laughs> I agree with that's that. That's good. Yes. Danny Roderick wrote this in Project Syndicate. Let me read this, and uh, perhaps this will propel some discussion as well. One of our era's foundational myths is that globalization has condemned the nation state to irrelevance. The revolution in transport and communications we hear has vaporized borders and shrunk the world. Domestic policymakers, it is said, are largely powerless in the face of global markets. The global financial crisis has shattered this myth. Who bailed out the banks, pumped in the liquidity, engaged in fiscal stimulus, and provided the safety nets for the unemployed to thwart an escalating catastrophe? Who is rewriting the rules on financial market supervision and regulation to prevent another occurrence? Who gets the lion's share of the blame for everything that goes wrong? 
The answer is always the same, national governments. But today's challenges cannot be met by institutions that do not yet exist. The nation state may be a relic bequeathed to us by the French Revolution, but it is all that we have. What do you think of that, Janet? I agree with that. No. Uh, the other thing, though, I think is very important to get into the conversation is that when we talk about the state, mm -hmm. we have to differentiate among different states in the world. For example? For example, that when he talks about uh, the states that have set the rules of globalization, that have been the facilitators of globalization, we need to talk about the states of the first world. We need to talk about the G8. You know, we need to talk about the powerful states. These are the states that are setting the rules. These are the states that are in control. And these are the states that are far from withering away. These are also the states that are uh, promoting democracy abroad often as a conditionality for aid. They are uh, forcing a, a certain form of institutionalization on other countries. Do you object to that? Well, in the sense that it, it, it has become window dressing for forced incorporation into an unequal global economy where populations have no capacity to influence their governments on questions about livelihood, on questions about natural resources, on questions about extractivism, on questions about their own destiny. So there's no meaning anymore. Mm. So regular elections become uh, you know, some kind of global litmus test for whether you deal with a regime or not. But that regime is only allowed to continue to be in existence as long as it plays by the rules of the global economy, which are set by the IMF and the World Bank and, and enforced by, the, uh, you know, by a few powerful yeah. countries. Having said that, Will, I'm guessing yeah. there aren't I, too I many people that. who are in yeah. France who think of themselves first as members of the European Union and second as Frenchmen. I'm guessing there are not too many Canadians who think of themselves as members of the G8 first and Canadians second. So the nation state, for, for all of its being called a relic here, it's still people's primary form of identity, isn't it? I agree that it's still uh, certainly the formal aspect for defining one's identity. Although studies in globalization show that people have more identities than they used to. That is, yes. the nation-state identity is not as exclusive or as powerful as others. But still number one. But still number one, probably. Uh, but I think that, uh, Professor, the, the statement that you wrote out by, read out by Professor Roderick, uh, I think it overestimates the importance of the state and fails to take into account that over the past 40 or 50 years, there, we have moved increasingly to building institutions, uh, first internationally and now globally, to deal with certain kinds of problems that we face. And the fact of the matter is, is that the kind of world that he projects and he idealizes the, the situation of the world that uh, Professor Sassen mentioned before, that is the, the way the world worked from 1945 to maybe the early 1970s. But since then, globalization has intensified. Mm -hmm. And we have problems like the global environment, like global health, that are profound challenges for the whole world's population. And so for him to, to want, I think, to go back in time and not face the reality that we do have to think about democracy not only in our nation states, but also how that might look in a broader globalized world. Fahim, is it not fair to say that it is more difficult than ever today for countries to represent their citizens' interests and aspirations because globalization has advanced on the world so vigorously? I think there are two different ways of looking at it. On the one hand, uh, globalization uh, directly affected the capacities, the abilities of national states to uh, be responsive, uh, to deal with issues in a way that they want to do. But on the other hand, if you look at some of the fascinating examples from, let's say, South Asia, you would realize that some of the, the states have become the market. Uh, I can give you one particular example from South Asia, Bangladesh. Because of the structural economic reforms and other programs that are being implemented, over the last 20 years or so, the state has become the market. And you cannot really separate these two. And, and this state uh, operates not just for the actors, the financial actors representing uh, different groups in Bangladesh, but for also actors that are representing a large number of actors outside of the country, all the 
actors uh, with regards to finance and production. So I think the, the, the people are confused. They, they see themselves as part of a democracy, but they don't know what democracy can produce for them or whether or not democracy would help them to achieve some of their broader objectives. And one of the reasons why they are also deeply frustrated with uh, is the fact that these so-called political institutions have become the actors of production and finance in a way that takes the focus, enter focus away from the priorities of the nation. And the garment industry in Bangladesh is, a fa is an amazing example. I think in the last few years we have seen uh, the criticisms, et cetera. The state knew that uh, these industries don't necessarily operate within any regulations, within any guidelines, mm -hmm. and it's all still right. they didn't do anything. But let me follow up on something you just said. When, when you say people perhaps don't know what democracy entails in all of its glory, I don't want to oversimplify this, but my hunch is around the world, when people think democracy, they think America. They think freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble uh, the way they want to, uh, to live where you want. I mean, that's what people I, think, don't I, they? I, I the think, right to vote. I think that's the popular perception mm -hmm. that people go to polling stations and vote for a particular political party not because they want X or Y to be just elected. They want them to represent their voices. And that doesn't really happen. And, and uh, the American model is not, I think, seen as the model of democracy anymore in many parts of the world. Recent examples from the Middle East, for instance, mm -hmm. I think they wanted democracy not because they wanted to institutionalize a Western uh, kind of democracy, but rather they wanted to address their financial challenges, the, the economic challenges, the hardship they were facing. And in less than a year, they were completely disappointed with the performance of the government. They knew this government uh, mm -hmm. in Egypt, for instance, was not able to do anything. Janet, let, me, the let me get you on that premise I threw out there, which is what most people in the world, given the power of the American idea, when they think democracy, they're thinking America. I don't agree with you. You don't agree? No. I think, again, all you have to do is go to a gathering like the World Social Forum, and you will witness uh, how many different democratic practices are actually underway in the world, democratic experiences, democratic experiments. I mean, Saskia mentioned the landless movement in, in Brazil. I mean, this is a movement of a million people that are occupying land, that are building self-sufficient communities, now, yeah. that are self-managing, right? They're running their own schools. I mean, th these kinds of experiments are underway everywhere in the world. And I want to just come back to, to Will's point about whether the notion of pulling back from the global is going back in time. Because I think there's, there's another way to think about it, and that is that the only hope for human survival and thriving is to reclaim food sovereignty, water sovereignty, energy sovereignty. And without sovereignties in these areas, democratic sovereignty is meaningless. Those aren't nation-state sovereignties, no, no, no. though, are they? Well, the, the, I, this is where Roderick is making an important point. The nation-state is imperfect. It's contradictory in many places in the world. It is the source of violence and dispossession, but it's also a source of protection, and especially across the third world. I mean, the state is still seen as a very important um, entity that people look to for some form of protection, even though it is deeply, deeply contradictory. Mm -hmm. So. It's not to, to valorize the nation state as an abstraction. It's to say that um, we cannot treat neoliberal globalization as if it is inevitable and if it's the, the natural destiny of all humanity. And that's what worries me about discussions about global democracy or global citizenship, is that there's this notion that uh, this is the only scale. And I agree that um, absolutely with you know, Saskia's characterization of her work that that I don't, I don't think that everybody who signed this uh, manifesto uh, thinks this. But the manifesto, nevertheless, uh, suggests, and I think they're not alone in suggesting this, that you have to go to the global scale in order to democratize globalization. And I would say, no, absolutely not. And you know, in this, right. on this point, it's, that, it's, it's important, it, it's instructive to think about the United Nations. Okay, The United Nations, founded at the end of World War II, uh, you know, it, with the kind of idea of a new international order and new possibilities for international collaboration and self determination it's, and self determination at the heart of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we've seen happen uh, since the end of the Cold War 
In the 1990s, the UN hosted this series of incredible conferences on women's rights, on indigenous rights, on, on human rights, on social development, on the environment, and it, was, it unleashed enormous capacities of civil society around the world. It was very, very exciting. But uh, as the Washington consensus, this neoliberal consensus tightened, it also tightened around the UN and it shut down those conversations at the UN. Hmm. And what we've seen happening since then is a shift from the messiness and the cacophony of voices at the General Assembly at the UN to the Security Council, which is controlled by a few big countries, uh, and to the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO. And I mean, that is what that's what global power looks like right now. And any discussion about globalizing democracy has got to take into account you know, these kinds of global power inequalities. And that we have the United Nations, that the, U that the US you know, has systematically defunded, that the Canadian government is systematically delegitimating, uh, that the great powers in the world are just try you know, trying to shove the General Assembly under the carpet somewhere. And like it or not, and, and, and get, you know, with its co many contradictions, the General Assembly at the UN is still a fuller representation of the world's peoples and diverse aspirations than anywhere else in the world. A lot of bad dudes in that place, though. There are bad dudes everywhere, yeah. man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Will, you wanted to say? Yeah, I just want to, to sort of supplement what uh, was just been said by adding, however, that there are certain circumstances where globalization and uh, international institutions like the United Nations have made possible changes that were prohibited by nation states. And the example that I think that is most important for us here in Canada is that related to Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Because in fact the Government of Canada systematically uh, over the past almost 200 years has, has had a particular view of Indigenous peoples and denied them the capacity to, to really think of themselves having own rights. Uh, but Canadian Indigenous people began to work together with other Indigenous people beginning already in the early 1970s at the United Nations, culminating in a special committee set, a, set, a, set up in 1982, followed by a permanent forum for Indigenous peoples being set up at the United Nations in 2000, leading finally to a universal declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples, which is a profound and fascinating document. That was all done by going around the nation state. Hmm. In fact, published material on how that took place shows that of the, all of the governments in the world that fought hardest against it, Canada was the leader. Right up until the very final warning of it, Canada fought it, and Canada was the last of the four who, who voted against it to agree to it. So the state in Canada put tremendous obstacles for Indigenous peoples to come up with a set of human rights that spoke to their particular circumstances, which we now have. So I think that the, the state, yes, it's very important for us, but also because of globalization, there are, a bit, we have certain abilities to go around the state, to work internationally or globally through something like the World Social Forum, which also worked that way, began to think of what is a different type of globalization, a counter-hegemonic one, one that was defined by the United States primarily and its allies. And that kind of discussion took place there so that globalization has facilitated the joining of social movements and other characteristics that don't necessarily always have to rely on the state. Yeah. Are, are you Canadian, incidentally, I was going to ask you. Are you Canadian? Yes. So how do you as a Canadian feel about the fact that Canada was so obstreperous on the issue that you just described. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed, just as I am ashamed by the way in which the, the government of Canada is, is dealing with uh, indigenous people's lands in, in northern parts of the country where there is resource extraction in place. Just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Saskia, let me bring you in on this question. What do you think it would take to get a consensus around democratic principles up to a global scale? Um, I, I would really appreciate if people notice that I use making, not democracy, as my basic category. And that means that I can think of all kinds of initiatives by people, big and small, by governments, etc. And, and the, the, the shaping category for me 
is that we become makers at whatever the level and in whatever the environment, of course, with an aspiration towards something that is distributed, that is that has justice in it. I don't believe that it can ever be perfect. Secondly, I just want to mention something about the state here. I think of the state as a capability, as I said before, and I think that I'm not ready to throw it out of the window. But right now, as I already said, the, the so-called liberal state is in absolute decay. The executive branch of government has basically become increasingly private with unaccountable power. And uh, it is fully aligned with global finance, with the IMF, et cetera, et cetera. So, and and the, when you deregulate, when you privatize, the legislative loses, you hollow it out. So there is a lot of work to be done. And I think that one of the tasks, so with, with individuals, with communities, with networks it's making, with the state, we need to reoccupy the state. I'm not ready to throw it out of the window because it is a mixture of different logics that is, as I said, far more complex than the richest corporation. You have a lot of people and nodding their heads here on that question of reoccupying the state. Okay, uh, how would you, you tell us how you would reoccupy a state? I, I think it, it's a two-way traffic. Uh, there would be a parallel process of um, democratizing the state at the national level and helping uh, the, the struggles for popular movements for greater social political change at the national level. And at, at the same time, I think we have to democratize the global institutions that would be affecting the decision-making processes at the national level. So it's a parallel process, and I, I'm looking at some of the wonderful examples uh, uh, in some of the parts of not really very known here, probably for many different reasons, where uh, the state is creating a space for popular organizations to register their voices and their concerns. And that's happening largely because of the fact that democracy is slowly taking roots. I think that's the first step. The state is, uh, is doing something positive for popular organizations to uh, reflect the desires, to reflect the the priorities of ordinary citizens. I think that's the first step, but nothing is going to happen unless I, we begin the process of democratizing global institutions. So these are the institutions that would eventually make all the important decisions on behalf of ordinary citizens. So I think it's, it's a dual process. You, we start with the, the, the national struggles, so national movements for democracy and social change, and then we look at uh, global institutions and further strengthen the movements for change at the regional and international level. Janet, did you like that word, reoccupying the democratic state? Well, I think, yeah, I think that's a great uh, phrase, and I think this is underway more in some places than in other places. Like, uh, one of the places that comes to mind is Bolivia, where, uh, you know, yes, we have exactly. a very powerful uh, indigenous movement where most of the population is indigenous, and they now have an indigenous president, and they are indigenizing the state. They are very self-conscious about the fact that the modern lib liberal state in Bolivia was a European colonial imposition, mm. and they are seeking to indigenize the state. Which means what exactly? Which means that they want to take seriously the fact that in Bolivia there are still intact indigenous modes of governance. There are indigenous systems of knowledge. Mm. There are indigenous languages right. that hold other yeah. uh, ways of thinking about the world, other ways of thinking about how humans should organize themselves, other ways of thinking about human, non-human relationships, other ways of thinking about the natural world. And I mean, Bolivia um, convened in the, in the, in the uh, vacuum uh, at the UN, Bolivia convened a very important conference a few years ago on the rights of Mother Earth, which is completely outside the liberal yes. paradigm, Pachamama. right? Mama. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's completely right. outside the yeah. liberal paradigm. But so yeah. here's an example of a state that is being reoccupied. Well, they never occupied it before, so it's not a reoccupation. It's an indigenization of the state. Um, Do we have that here? The only reason I ask, uh, whether we're doing it here in Canada, you remember John Ralston Saul wrote that book, A Fair Country? Mm -hmm. And he said we actually do, in the book, he made the argument that we are in many respects a, a Métis nation that have taken unto ourselves mm -hmm. a re-indigenizing, if you like, mm -hmm. some of our traditions. Even our Westminster style of mm -hmm. government is not mm -hmm. exactly like it's like in the UK. I mean, I think the Idle No More movement uh, has mm -hmm. put this on the agenda in Canada. But we don't have political parties with the ears to hear this. And we certainly, in the government, have a government that's hostile to it. Will, follow up on that? Yeah, I'd like to follow up, but to also, again, move back to maybe a global level to talk about changes that 
have occurred at the national level are, have also occurred actually at the global level. And let's take the area of global health. So before the uh, start of the 1980s, the World Health Organization was the dominant and most profound and important institution for dealing with global health. That is the kinds of health problems that are global, like communicable diseases and so on and so forth. But beginning in the 1980s, as more uh, countries from the former third world became participants in there, the United States pulled back. It pulled back its funding. Because? Because uh, it no longer could control what was going on in the, in the World Health Organization. So that if we jump ahead now to the present day, the World Health Organization is no longer the most important funding agency for global health. The most important is the Bill and Melinda Dates mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. foundation, foundation by yeah. far and the second most important ironically is the World Bank yeah. and the World Bank is 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 well known for not being a, a paragon of democracy so even in the international level and when we can talk about global governance and democracy there has been a decay that is parallel to the one that we've been talking about within the nation can, state. Can I ask you an odd follow-up, though? A lot of people think the Gates Foundation is doing a better job than the WHO ever did at eradicating awful diseases and so on uh, because they're not captive to, uh, let's say, radicalized political interests as some people would see them and that they can actually get stuff done better and faster. I don't agree with that. Don't I think agree. that the World Health Organization through the World Health Assembly is actually a fairly democratic institution and has been had been quite effective it needed leadership and it's had various leaders that were weak but i think when it has had strong leadership it has has worked fairly well so i i just don't agree with that i think that the the that foundation works in a completely undemocratic way it's a very untransparent yeah, secretive way saskia I, I was just going to say we need to enable uh, multiple communities within states around the world on the health question. And that is where the, the WHO really was a very significant achievement. And it got, you know, hollowed out, weakened out, because certain governments didn't want it. I mean, look, the, the, Doha, the Doha World WTO round, what happened there is, is that the pharmaceuticals didn't like the way the discussion was going. So we really have an incredible problem of abuse of power by, by some actors that are corporations and some governments. The United States has really played a very destructive role. Janet wants and to finish her point here. Playing. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I remember what I wanted to say. I mean, I think we can all probably agree that um, democratization needs to happen at multiple scales sim simultaneously, right? Yeah. So it's not to valorize the, right. the national scale or the global scale. But in terms of the, the question about democratizing the institutions of global government, so, so back to governance, back to Fahim's point, um, it seems to me that uh, some of these global scale institutions may be more promising than others. Uh, but there is a risk here in, um, in the notion of democratizing that, we're, that we legitimate what are really illegitimate institutions. And I mean, I think this was the debate in the anti-globalization movement around participating in consultations with the World Bank, the IMF, and the WTO 10 years ago. And it sparked a big debate about you know, whether these institutions should be fixed or should be mixed. And over several years, the movement concluded pretty much worldwide that they needed to be mixed because the rules of the game were fixed. They were already set. And so simply participating or having global civil society show up at the table was not going to change the rules of the game. So unless the neoliberal consensus is up for question and up for debate, then uh, democratizing those institutions I don't see as very promising. But some of them are more open and more promising than others. I mean, the UN being an example. Well, I, I, you'd have to say that they probably are up for debate because Russia and China uh, think that they're, in some respects, propagating their versions of democracy, and they're certainly mm -hmm. not the same as our versions. Yeah. And, and I guess, Saskia, I'll ask you that. In light of what's going on right now in Russia and China, is it clear at all that democracy is something that most citizens in this world want? I, again, you know, this term democracy for me is a bit wobbly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, 
I, I just, I really think that we need, on the one hand, and I've written a book about this, you know, how does social change happen in complex systems? And it's not a question of throwing out everything that is there. It is recovering capabilities. So back to the example of WHO, right? But positioning them in new logic. So I don't want to throw out the state. I want to capture it, but I need to reposition its various capabilities, its diverse capabilities in different logics. So for me, the, the guiding, what, what gives me my foothold into this very complex sort of condition that we're living in, and that we've lived in the past too, for that matter, I'm not saying that this is unique, is, is not this issue of democracy as much as this issue of, you know, what are the organizing logics through which capabilities exert their influence. So I like a lot what happened in Bolivia, the whole notion of recovering another version, you know, the Pachamama and all of that, you know, that is wonderful. You cannot replicate that everywhere. In Germany, that wouldn't work. You need other things. So I really, for me, it's a bit, what is at ground level and how do we make it work for a larger sort of more distributed process. The reason I sort of avoid a bit the term democracy is, and I, I prefer distributed, uh, because democracy comes already with such a charge. I mean, I really have a problem with concepts that are invitations not to think, you know, when we say, when we use certain concepts. And um, so I am forever, so I'm now writing a little book that I call Before Method, where I'm dealing with all these big categories, you know. <laughs> what do we do with all of this stuff that, that really creates an enormous shadow effect uh, in terms of our discussions about how can we make this a better world. Good. Huh? Just down to our last few so minutes I here, back so to I want uh, Fahim to come in at this point. I, I, I think uh, part of the reason why I became excited about the prospect for us to reimagine democracies, the, the popular movements that are happening in different parts of the world. I think there are yeah, two things that are right. cent there are two things that are centered. Yeah. One of which would be to to expand human choices. I think if we could start exploring possibilities of expanding human choices through different means, democracy then becomes a meaningful exercise for us. We can add a substantive content yes. to it. That the new narrative would be not around uh, free and so-called free and fair elections or accountability or responsiveness. It would be mainly about establishing rights, protecting rights, including the rights of ethno-religious minorities. I think that's one of the issues why people are becoming increasingly concerned about the fate of democracy, what democracy can deliver for them. The second issue, I think, is about the, the inclusive growth. I, people can participate in, in the process of economic growth, but we are realizing that they cannot really benefit from their participation. So unless we add another dimension where people are given the opportunity to benefit, truly benefit from this, uh, this exercise of, of growth, nothing is likely to happen. And the third thing is the participatory democracy. You have the right. You don't really give up your right by just voting. You can hold people accountable to everything that you do. In other words, I think we have to reimagine democracy, not in the former sense, but yes, in- Yes, I agree. Hmm. Will, right. with, with about a minute left, yeah. Will, let me give it to you. In, in many ways today, during our conversation, it sounds like globalization is both a threat to democracy, but a potential opportunity. Can it be both at the same time? Yes, it can. And when we talk about globalization, we can talk about economic globalization, political, we can talk about cultural globalization, we can talk about social globalization, and in all of those types of processes, there are good and bad. And I've given you one good example of social globalization, and that, that were refers to the situation of indigenous peoples and how that has, has grown. And, and even before that, the, the whole issue of global health, I think, was for a long time a very promising development. It has been undermined to a certain degree. So I think that, that globalization as, as a set of processes is with us here. And we, we, it really depends upon who's shaping it, who's shaping globalization processes, who's in control, and who, who isn't. Who would you like to see shape it? I think that what all of us around this table have said, we, we think that everyone should participate in the shaking of it, shaping of it. It shouldn't just be uh, the leaders of our governments necessarily, or, or leaders of uh, the corporations which have become more prominent, so on and so forth. Or, or the experts. experts, right. Gotcha. That's our time. Thanks everybody for coming in today for a really engaging discussion. Saskia Assassin, the co-chair of the Committee on Global Thought, she's with Columbia University, coming to us tonight from London, UK. Fahim Kadir from York University. William Coleman from the Balsody School of International Affairs. Janet Conway, Brock University. Thanks so much everybody. Great to have you here at TVO tonight.
Great Thank night. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.